Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Christian Weedbrook is the founder CEO of a fascinating company that I want to tell you about called Xanadu Quantum. Uh, he uh, recently received an award and made a speech at the Toronto Region Board of Trade uh, annual dinner, and uh, and it was really quite motivating because he he talked about quantum computing, he talked about his company, he talked about uh, being a unicorn, he talked about uh, Toronto being an epicenter for technological development and and how um, we could attract people from around the world, including himself, uh, who came from, I think it was Australia, you said, uh, and uh, and that we should do more of this and that there was an opportunity uh, in that regard. So I thought it'd be great to check in with him and find out a little bit more about him, his own path, about uh, Xanadu, uh, about quantum computing, and about uh, Toronto as a technological center. Christian, welcome to the, to the show, sir. Great. Thank you for having me, Brian. So why did you win this award? That's a good question. I, I honestly, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, I was really happy that uh, Xanadu was acknowledged and we were able to, uh, you know, speak about what we're doing at Xanadu. But honestly, uh, you know, for that particular um, night, uh, there's a few speakers, in, including myself, and we're talking about, um, you know, daring to lead and doing, uh, you know, taking on some moonshot uh, sort of projects. And I think, you know, what we're doing at Xanadu fits that perfectly. Uh, after all, it is something where we're pushing the, the boundaries of what computers can do. Um, and, uh, you know, we want to build something really great in, um, in, in Canada. Uh, I think there's a lot of great companies here in Canada already. Um, but where are the kind of uh, the SpaceX's or uh, Tesla's or these sort of really inspiring uh, in terms of deep tech companies? And so that's what Xanadu hopes to be. And so far, so good. So maybe take a step back, if you could, and tell us first about what is uh, quantum computing, and then maybe we can go into what Xanadu is doing to try to address that. Yeah, for sure. Um, perhaps I can, uh, to explain quantum computing, start off with a pretty cool example. Um, so what we did is the team built a quantum computer um, that solved a problem that would have taken the world's fastest supercomputer, which is in Japan, uh, called Fugaku. It would have taken this computer... If you'd run all 7.2 million cores of this supercomputer in Japan, it would have taken 7 million years to solve this problem. This problem is very specific. It's a, it's a very kind of weird math problem, but we know it to be very challenging to solve. So it would have taken 7 million years. We built a computer called Borealis here in downtown Toronto that solved the same problem in two minutes. And that gives uh, uh, the listeners an idea of this, this craziness. So from this simple example, from 7 million years down to two, min two minutes, it shows that um, you can actually solve problems that typically would have been out of reach. 7 million years is intractable. It's, it's out of reach. Uh, and then reduce it down to something that can be solved in two minutes. So essentially, that shows you what a quantum computer is. You can actually um, reduce the time it takes to solve a problem. Now, there's certain problems that you know maybe take a year, six months, or a year. Uh, that's on one end of the spectrum. And the other end of the spectrum is something that could take millions of years. And so quantum computing is very good at making the intractable tractable. And also things that, you know, certain problems that can take a few months up to a year down to a few seconds or a few hours. So that, that's what a quantum computer uh, can do, which is really exciting. So what is a quantum computer? You know, we think about, you know, running in series, running in parallel. What is this? A whole bunch of things running in parallel. Like, what is it? Yeah, you can think of it. Uh, for us, we actually use light or photons to do this. So, so really the answer is it's still a computer. Um, for us, uh, we're building it not out of electronics, uh, but out of uh, photonics, uh, essentially. So if you came and saw our, uh, our Borealis machine that I mentioned, uh, it would look like an optical table with a lot of bunch of optical elements on it. It doesn't look like a, a computer maybe the average listener would be thinking, like a phone or a desktop computer. It would be more analogous to um, data centers. Um, you know, so you see all these racks of server racks in this large room. So that's really what our computer is, is heading towards. Um, so it looks like a lot of every, everyday optical elements, but you can actually convert these, uh, you see lasers, um, and all these lasers and fiber optics, you can actually, weirdly enough, um, put them all together to create a computer. Now, I, I guess the other interesting thing is you do access this device over the cloud. So what you would do is you'd log in on your computer and connect to the internet and then control this, this weird computer I was talking about, and uh, you can solve a problem using it. So the interface is still what we'd be used to, say, on a home computer. 
but if you came into our our lab and saw it, it looked like a uh, a really weird thing. It's like that's a computer. Like, how, how is that computing something? But you know, um, you can really compute out of anything uh, and any device. And for us, when you want to kind of leverage the quantum computing nature, the quantum nature, uh, we use light. The other interesting thing, perhaps, Brian, is so first of all, it's still a computer. It can do really amazing things. But the reason why it can do amazing things is. Um, you're now building on something that uses different laws of physics. So let's say, you know, we were out, outside throwing a Frisbee. If I throw a Frisbee to you or you throw it to me, we're not shocked at how it propagates or evolves through the air. It's like you throw it, it may go off target, but you're not too, too uh, uh, shocked by it. Now, and that's governed by our typical laws of physics. But there's a different set of laws of physics if you zoom in on anything, if you zoom in on our bodies on a table you zoom into the atomic world if you zoom in enough you get to the atoms and and electrons and so forth those things that we don't have everyday experience with actually have different laws associated with them so in this kind of weird analogy if you're throwing a frisbee in the atomic world a different set of laws will govern how the frisbee propagates now more specifically you can have things like the electron is either over there or over a different place the position it's in two places at once now, there's this famous, as you, I'm sure you know, Schrodinger's cat. It's dead or alive. Uh, it's dead and alive at the same time. And so these are the weird things. Anyway, it, it kind of blo if it blows your mind, that's normal. It happens to all of us. And it really doesn't seem true. But experiments, and including our quantum computer, really back up these uh, weird theories. So what is quantum? Explain quantum, if you could. Yeah, quantum really is um, essentially... Um, when you are analyzing or understanding uh, um, the, the electrons and atoms and things of that nature, um, that's the quantum world. So, so think of it as, as a set of rules or properties or laws that dictate um, things on the very small uh, microscopic nature. So as I was mentioning, atoms is a good one, single parts of light, photons, um, electrons, and how they behave, how they evolve, how they propagate through time and so forth. We call that quantum physics or quantum mechanics. The key thing there is, is, is honestly, it's just we're all made up of, of atoms. <clears throat> These atoms have different laws and they govern certain by different set of laws that we're used to. So it's uh, the, the amazing thing. I was reading a book on quantum, a popular science book. And, and in 1900, very early last century, um, no one believed, most people didn't believe there were atoms existed, like some of the well-known scientists of the day, which blows our minds these days. You know, we're so used to th electrons and atoms and all these things existing, we don't question it. But not that long ago, people uh, weren't sure that it existed. And now we're talking in, um, in this century now, not only that they exist, but we can actually use them to do computing with, which is quite fascinating. So simplistically, and I'm going to get this wrong, but let me try. So simplistically, you're building a computer that uses light rather than electronics and is at the microscopic atom uh, photon level rather than whatever our current uh, environment is described as. And because of that, uh, it can work a lot faster. 100% right. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Well, that's great. So other than solving math problems that usually take 7 million years in uh, two minutes, what else can your computer do? Yeah. So um, first off, a lot of people didn't think you could do these sorts of math problems. You know, it's like, well, this is kind of impossible to really leverage these quantum, very small microscopic systems and do computing with them. Um, so that was the first step is choosing a math problem. Now, the next step over the coming uh, three to five years is how do you now actually solve problems of interest for businesses and customers? And so no one has, has done that yet. The technology and the computers like Borealis need to get bigger, more scalable, so you can start solving important customer problems. But once we get there, really people talk about a few different industries uh, where quantum computing can have dramatic impact. One is pharmaceuticals. Um, another one is finance. Another one is AI. And another one is uh, quantum chemistry and material design. All of these, as the systems get bigger and more complex, gets harder to solve. So, for instance, pharmaceuticals, um, how do you develop, if you had a large enough quantum computer, how do you develop better candidates for drug discovery? That's a key one. Uh, another one is material design. How do you develop new materials um, that can actually be faster, cheaper, better? For instance, what we're doing at Xanadu, if and when we have this large-scale quantum computer, 
how does a customer like Volkswagen or other car companies use these computers to actually develop new materials for next generation battery? So how do you use a computer to generate a new battery that's faster um, to charge? I mean, a single charge takes 10 times faster. A single charge lasts 10 times longer in terms of the kilometers or miles. And these are the things that a quantum computer can really uh, help achieve. The, the intuition behind this, if you take drug discovery or even material design, the way people actually develop new drugs, um, they use computers. They use traditional computers. They can be large-scale computers. And you simulate the system that you care about. And that pops up thousands of different possibilities of drugs that you can synthesize. But the very interesting thing in drug discovery, I think that we all kind of hear these stats, um, after 10 years, a billion dollars or so, um, the candidate you thought was a good drug, 80% of them fail. Yeah, yeah, 80% of them fail. So how do you actually get that error rate down significantly? Well, you need better computers, and our solution is quantum computing. What a fascinating uh, experience that you've had, and, uh, and it sounds like a world-changing computer that you're uh, developing. Uh, you also had a, an interesting story about Toronto and uh, and and whether this is a a potentially a nexus for this kind of development. And you challenged people in the audience uh, to uh, to whether we could have that supportive environment. And and I think that's what the the board of trade dinner was all about with this dare to lead. Uh, maybe we'll take a break and come back and chat a little bit about that in two minutes. Stay with us, everyone. Back with Christian in just two minutes, talking about quantum computing technology in the Toronto marketplace and his success in building just an incredible company. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. I'm chatting tonight with Christian uh, Weedbrook. He is the founder, president, CEO of a, an interesting company in Toronto called Xanadu, um, and uh, he's building photonic quantum computers. Uh, he won an award recently at the at the... Uh, Toronto Region Board of Trade, uh, big dinner of the year. And uh, I reached out to him because I wanted to find out a little bit more about Xanadu. Um, first of all, I got to ask you, you know, you've got a Bachelor of Science and a, and a, and a PhD in quantum information theory from uh, the University of Queensland. Uh, you've worked uh, at Boston Consulting Group. You got a postdoctoral research fellow at uh, MIT, postdoctoral research fellow at, at the University of Toronto. What brought you to start Xanadu in Toronto rather than in Australia or, or Boston or, or wherever. Yeah. Typically when you finish your PhD, say, say in my case in Australia, it's encouraged you go overseas, get some experience. Uh, the next step is a postdoc, uh, continue to do research at a university somewhere around the world. Um, so for me, that was, um, going to MIT. Uh, I'd work with the folks there during my PhD. So it was a great experience to work there. And then after that, um, got a job offer in uh, university of Toronto. And so that work essentially led me to Toronto. And it's just really funny feeling. As soon as I landed in Toronto, it felt like home. And it felt like I was kind of destined to be here. And uh, then really any thought of going back to Australia, at least permanently, uh, was, was put on hold. And now I'm proudly a Canadian citizen as well as a still Australian citizen. And just love the city. Um, from a work point of view, though, um, you know, in quantum computing, a lot of talent is – just in Canada in general, but definitely in, in Toronto. Um, and if you look at the similarities between Australia and Canada, where the, both governments have put a lot of money into the academic side over the last two decades or more and training people in quantum computing and other quantum technologies. Um, so it is a really great place to start um, a company. So Xanadu was actually started in 2016. And around the mid 20, 2010s, uh, more and more incubators were starting up. In, uh, in Toronto, so incubators that would help startups get started. Um, a lot more funding uh, was, uh, you know, venture capitalists uh, was going great there and a lot of new funds were, were created. Uh, and as I said uh, before, there's so much talent here in Canada and Toronto as well that you could actually leverage and build. You know, at Xanadu, we have approximately 200 people and just over 50% are from overseas. Um, so you've got that nice balance, which is reminiscent of Toronto. Uh, you know, 50% are from, uh, from Canada and 50% uh, are from overseas. Uh, so we've been able to do the opposite of the brain drain, which typically happens in, in Australia, but also in Canada. And uh, we're excited to bring people from all around the world here. And that's essentially uh, th their excitement is shared by myself and just love Toronto. 
would you be more successful or would you be able to raise more capital if you were in Silicon Valley? I, uh, that, that's a good question. Um, I don't think so. You, you know, um, you, you know, what's funny, I'll give you a, uh, an interesting example. During COVID, um, we raised a uh, hundred million dollars um, for our series B and we raised it from investors uh, from Silicon Valley and, uh, you know, in, in that round and we never met them. It took, you know, uh, till COVID ended for us to even meet them in person. So um, it was a very obviously unique situation, uh, but in that case, you couldn't travel. So venture capitalists were, were okay taking meetings and not even meeting you uh, in person. So it's a very unique time in history. And then our round of 100 million after that was led by um, Georgian, uh, which is one of the best VCs in, in Canada, based in Toronto. And so, you know, I think um, there's no shortage of capital here in Canada these days. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to go to the Valley. We've kind of done a, a nice uh, bit of both. Um, I also think it gives you some sort of, um, you, you know, if, the, if you've got a crowded market in Silicon Valley and some of these uh, uh, investors want to invest around outside of the world, we are kind of unique being in Canada as well. So I think things have changed in the last 10 years or more where you kind of needed to go there. You know, we, we get people saying, are you going to move to the U.S.? Uh, you know, we've raised so far a quarter billion dollars. It's like, well, now's the time to go to the U.S.? And uh, we keep saying no. Uh, our headquarters will always be in Toronto and we won't be moving. But having said that, you know, the U.S. particularly is a great market. We've just opened up a, an office there recently. And so, you know, we are playing worldwide, but our HQ will always be in Toronto. Are you public or private? We're private. But yet uh, I've heard you described as a unicorn. Yeah. So in the private markets, um, we're, we're valued at a billion dollars uh, U.S. So that, you know, the definition of, of a unicorn uh, in terms of the private markets. I uh, hope to go uh, public at some point. Uh, it's always really the standard way of repaying our investors who've shown a lot of faith in us. Uh, we still need the technology to be uh, to evolve and a few more breakthroughs, uh, which are on our on our uh, roadmap, and then we'll go public. Uh, two weeks ago, you got three point seven five million dollars from the Federal Economic Development Agency for Southern Ontario, and uh, a couple of weeks ago, you got uh, some money uh, from the University of British Columbia. Engineering Electric. If you raise two hundred fifty million dollars and you got a billion dollar valuation, why do you take three million bucks from the Canadian government? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, basically, we're not done yet in terms of uh, raising money. So, um, you know, if if we had uh, two hundred fifty million was was enough, we wouldn't need any more money. Uh, but this is something that's very capital intensive, and um, you know, we're 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 not done yet. So we're very appreciative of the Canadian government, particularly. Uh, we also got Strategic Innovation Fund that was, I believe, $40 million uh, Canadian. Um, and the Canadian government is really helping us and other quantum companies to commercialize uh, quantum technology. So very thankful. And it's always good to get non dilutive funding, um, given the fact that we um, need to keep raising money. And also uh, a lot of the grants, particularly the $40 million, uh, we, we will and need to pay back as well. So it's a good investment, uh, both sides. Uh, in addition to money, you've done a bunch of uh, sort of uh, fellowship programs and other things. And you announced one recently with Qatar, which I was surprised by. Yeah, so we work. Uh, so that's uh, we're full stack. So we have our, our um, hardware and we have our software. So think of like a cloud compute company, but it's all quantum. So we have quantum hardware, quantum software. Um, and what you're referring to there, our software, we love to have it all around the world. Um, and we have it, I believe, in um, 40 universities around the world, including uh, in Doha. And uh, we have it in uh, 20 or 22 countries around the world now. So we really want to be a world uh, player and really represent Canada uh, in, in this as well. And so really uh, thankful for all the universities that we work with. So is your and Xanadu's experience unique or is this something that, uh, you know, we can use as an example for 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 what Toronto and what uh, Ontario and Canada can do in 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 the Toronto sort of ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's bigger than than Xanadu. Um, I, I think that um, we're just one example of of what you can do. You know, as I mentioned before, where, where's uh, Canada's SpaceX? Where's Canada's um, Tesla? Things of that nature. Where are these big deep tech bets? 
And Xanadu is trying to be that, but we, you know, we're just the, the next one uh, in line. And uh, I think more and more people can do this. You really have to, you know, these things are governed by hungry and obsessive entrepreneurs who I think can change the world. It doesn't matter what country you're in. So I think giving more examples um, to, to other entrepreneurs and they can kind of think, well, if Xanadu can do it, uh, you know, I, I think we can do it as well. So it's unique in terms of quantum computing, but deep tech has many different areas and we're seeing a lot of different startups get um, incubated and getting funding. So I think uh, the future is really exciting. So if you were advising uh, the Premier of Ontario, the Prime Minister of Canada, or the Minister of Innovation, uh, uh, what would you be telling them to do? More money, more more cross-pollination between universities and companies, what? I, I would say, as, as we were mentioning before, quantum computing still needs a lot of money. It's still, it's not at the early days, it's kind of in the middle now. But uh, if we want to be like a TSMC or a Samsung or, you know, some big company in a fairly small country, we need government help. And um, so I would suggest, you know, to any politician uh, to come visit us, see what we're doing in our lab. And, and people get even more excited when they see, see real life quantum computers. Uh, but more money is always great. Um, and as I said, it's not just as bigger than Xanadu. Uh, there's a lot of quantum companies in Canada and also Ontario and Toronto. And I think uh, all of us can, can benefit from more funding. Um, and, and, you know, these, these sorts of things is, is, you know, how do you make Canada a world player? On the scene in quantum computing like think the way we think about quantum computing is it's kind of like the early 90s with the internet and the mid 70s with the pc revolution you know imagine how transformational those became quantum computing is like that now imagine that canada is a world leader and can actually um you know really change canada for the better and also change the world as well and so I, i'd encourage you know government officials to come visit zanu and other quantum companies and also keep investing as they have been have you seen the movie about BlackBerry? Um, you know, you Not yet. Look, you Not take yet. a look. At, you take a look at that movie. You take a look at uh, you know whether it be Microsoft or Apple. Seems to that there's there's a need for this combination between the the technological genius and the marketing genius. Do you have that combination at Xanadu? Yeah, we do. We do. I, I would say um, the difference between um, say BlackBerry and Apple at the moment. Um, is the marketing was very key there and the marketing will be key for Xanadu at some point. What it is now is uh, really changing the world of, um, of computing first. So getting the technology right, that's really key. As I was mentioned before, we, we've, uh, we're now focused on solving important business problems and that really needs our technology and everyone else's technology in quantum computing to be more advanced and scale up more. And then we can start really worrying about the marketing side of things. Also, you know, really this decade will be characterized by more B2B uh, sort of marketing engagements. So we will offer our quantum cloud compute um, over the cloud. We, we do at the moment, but in terms of larger scale and businesses can access the cloud. So one day we hope to be in consumer products and make even more of an impact. Uh, but at the moment, it's more cloud service uh, for our for our computers. So you say you've got to go from these math problems to business problems. What? What? Give me an example of a math, of a business problem. You talked about, uh, you know, identifying pharmaceutical uh, compounds that might be successful. How would you actually do that? Yeah. So maybe more specifically, um, I also mentioned the the material design. Um, so we work with a lot of car companies on, um, you know, if when we have this large scale quantum computer, how can you use it to identify better candidates? Uh, to develop a new battery. And so what's very interesting, not many people know, but a lot of the car companies actually have small quantum computing teams, which is quite fascinating. And so we work with all of them, do projects and so forth. So, you know, in terms of your question, how does it work? Well, it's, it's very, very complicated. So what happens is um, inherently these systems of, say, batteries or drugs, they're governed by quantum physics. So they're, uh, they're governed by these types of laws that I mentioned that are very different to our, our laws. So um, given that, you now need to understand where is the computational challenge of developing a new drug, a new battery. So, so typically what happens is you use a lot of compute power, not, not quantum, but you know, just traditionally, a lot of compute power to develop new candidates. So the idea there is, is that they're solving a particular simulation problem. Um, and the simulation is simulating, well, if I develop this candidate or this other candidate, this is what it will do. Now, it's imperfect. As I mentioned, 80% of these simulations and candidates fail. So what you do with a quantum computer is you replace a traditional computer with a quantum computer and you start simulating the physics of a battery, the physics of a drug. 
And then by doing that, you can actually then extend that out and have a better idea of what candidate that you're simulating in, in, in computational space um, decide what candidate is the best. So it's much more, you know, mathy than that, uh, because ultimately you have to find out the math of the quantum computer, the math of, of say a drug and match those two things behind the scenes. But essentially it comes back to the simulation of a very complicated system. And why not use a, a, another quantum system that you're trying to simulate in this case, a quantum computer. Sounds fascinating. You know, in uh, pharmaceutical uh, approvals, as you correctly point out, often, uh, you know, 80%, if not more of the, the potential candidates fail, but they fail after like five or seven years. And uh, they fail when uh, they can't separate out from placebo in a, in a double blind uh, placebo controlled uh, uh, study. So what you're talking about is that you can actually, what, predict through simulations, how a drug is actually going to perform in a study in humans? Yeah, exactly right. I, I would say that's more in the future. Because uh, as you pointed out, uh, you know, you have different clinical trials of these things. And before the clinical trials, you do a lot of computational work and simulation. So a lot of the sort of the, the background work is done in computers and also heuristics. You've got very smart people. You've got data uh, and, and so forth. And then they'll choose the best candidates to then go into the different clinical trials. And like you said, then you see how it interacts with a human being, which is another complex system again. Um, quantum computers will, will give you the best idea of this whole range, but particularly in the choice of simulation results at the very beginning before clinical trials. Now, some people believe, not this decade or beyond, that you can actually simulate how the drug reacts with a complex system like the human body. Uh, but that's further out. In principle, that's possible. But now we're really talking about very, very complex systems, even more so than what we're, we're dealing with now. You know, it's interesting because, uh, you know, what you're sort of suggesting is that you can find out through uh, all your simulations the one thing that works. I've had a little bit of experience with this. Um, and, uh, and often actual blood plasma works better than recombinant. And, uh, and, and some of the reasons why is they would suggest that a cocktail, a mixture of a bunch of different things that happen in nature actually ends up being better than that one little part of the blood fractionation. Um, in, uh, in, in pharmaceutical products, HIV and other things, for example, um, uh, cocktails have ended up working better than the one single drug. Mm. And so it almost wonders if you try to figure out that one single thing, you're actually not serving your purpose well because sometimes it's a basket of things that end up being the solution it could be you're right and, and so a quantum computer in principle should be able to simulate a cocktail of things in the simulation stage as well so um you know i, I think the first step is for us is to simulate you know one or two uh, initially and then go beyond that as you mentioned different combination or a cocktail of things the, the key thing there, though, is um, you really do need a more powerful quantum computer. So at the moment, the, uh, the demonstration of Borealis that I mentioned has 216 qubits. Um, and that's one of the most, um, that's the largest quantum computer when it comes to these sort of computational demonstrations. But you are actually looking to get a million qubits. Uh, and that's where the industry is headed. And that a million qubits will be essentially like a small data center that's all wired and networked up. And then customers can log in for these certain sort of problems that we're talking about. The denominator you mentioned, qubit, what's that? What's a qubit? Yeah, qubit. So um, first place uh, perhaps to start is it's from, it's a quantum bit. So a bit is, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of listeners will be familiar with is uh, a bit of information, so a zero or a one. Uh, a quantum version of a bit uh, is actually zero or one, but you can also have fascinatingly uh, a combination of zero and one. So some combination of zero, plus some combination of one. And that plus or combination is a superposition. So that's when you hear about things, uh, you know, in, in the popular media where it says you can now compute instead of with a zero or a one, um, you can compute with zero and one at the same time. And so, you know, if, if a, a computer basically takes inputs, a traditional computer, zeros or ones, you have logic gates acting on them. Um, through these combination of logic gates, you can perform an algorithm. And at the end, you have your answer to your algorithm. It could be addition. It could be checking email. It could be watching a movie as it gets more and more complicated. A quantum one, though, you don't have to choose between zero or one to put in. You can put zero and one in at the same time and then compute on and gates and, and so forth. So you start seeing now that um, you've got these, um, you know, give you an example, three bits. It would be zero, 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 all the way down to one, one, one. And it's eight combinations of these three bits 
you can actually have a quantum computer that has all eight possibilities at the same time rather than choosing between any of the eight. And so you see this exponential sort of blow up in, in the scaling of it. So that's typically how people explain the inherent um, benefit of quantum computers. Sounds pretty confusing to me, but you're the <laughs> smart guy that'll figure it all out. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back with Christian in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with uh, Christian Weedbrook. Uh, he is the founder, president, CEO of a company by the name of Xanadu. Uh, actually, in your uh, in your title, it's Xanadu AI. Artificial intelligence has been in the news big time in the last uh, little while. Um, tell me, are you worried about AI or are you excited about AI? I I'm excited about AI. I think it's a, a lot of fascinating things. I, I think, um, you know, that's, uh, we're, we're always asked, for instance, well, what's the crossover between quantum computing and AI? And uh, that's something actually Xanadu is one of the pioneers in understanding if you had this large scale quantum computer, how can you actually leverage it, uh, leverage it uh, for artificial intelligence? So um, really the take home message is unclear yet, um, but Xanadu and others are working on things where, you know, there's a lot of hope there because AI at the moment, if you look at Chat, chat GPT, uh, for instance, and, and other ones like it, the amount of parameters that need to be trained, it's getting up to a trillion parameters. And the amount of money that needs to be, um, you know, invested in just the training side of things is hundreds of millions of dollars. And so, as you know, Chat GPT is far from perfect. So, as we get more and more complex uh, AI systems, more and more parameters and many more millions of dollars, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars will be needed. So it's not headed in the right direction uh, as time increases. So the hope is that a quantum computer um, it will be able to have smaller models, small for a quantum computer, that can actually train on, uh, on the data. So you can actually suppress the cost and the number of parameters. But we're still working on that, and we hope to have some exciting results in that in the coming years. So if you throw that in the mix, that's another thing where people need to really start thinking, uh, you know, are you worried or excited about quantum machine learning? But I'm an optimist uh, by nature, and I think there's uh, far more good, uh, like most technologies, than, and then bad uh, effects. I think a lot of the, the hype also leads to a lot of pessimism uh, on things, too, and I'm, I'm less um, clear that that will be the case. There's been a bunch of... Uh you know, talk about regulation and uh, and and uh, ways to restrict how uh, AI can do. And I think based on this fear that somehow the machine's going to take over the world and 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 take over our lives. Uh, what do you think about government regulation of uh, of AI? Well, first off, I think our phone has already taken over our lives. <laughs> it's. I think we're all kind of you know obsessed with it. We don't really know it, um, but I think regulation is is needed. Um, I, I guess the the question is how much or how little regulation is needed. And, and, and I don't have an answer to that. Um, but I think the, the inherent idea that this could be dangerous um, is important. Um, you know, quantum technology, for instance, is something that's starting to get regulated. Uh, there's a lot of discussions on this. And I think uh, particularly the US will um, have export restrictions on quantum technology at some point and to varying degrees. So that we're seeing in real time in our industry, uh, it's slowly being regulated, which I think is it's not a bad thing. Uh, you know, the idea there is you don't want to, we're seeing it with GPUs and, you know, you, there's restrictions on who you can actually ship it to as well. So um, I, I think it's natural for these things to happen. Just make sure we don't over-regulate it, which is always a, you know, a hard thing to sort of quantify. Given that you're located in Toronto in Canada uh, and those export restrictions may not apply to you, is that actually a benefit or is it going to be a, a hindrance because, you know, the defense establishment in the United States won't, may not want to do business with you? Well, I think um, historically, at least, the Canadian government has really uh, taken, um, you know, followed the lead of the U.S. in terms of these things. So um, whatever happens in the U S I think will predominantly happen here. So we'll be also restricted, even if we were based in the U S you know, we, we, we will follow those, uh, those laws, um, whatever they end up being. And, uh, we, we actually, uh, take, take money and work with the Canadian government in terms of the military and also, um, work with DARPA and others in the U S as well. So, um, we're happy to follow their lead and we'll go from there. 
There's a fascinating book called Homo Deus. I'm not sure if you had a chance to uh, to read it, uh, written by an Israeli philosopher that was uh, really worried about the future um, and described a world where where some rich humans might have artificial intelligence, uh, medical devices, et cetera, embedded in them, and therefore they become almost superhuman and almost a different species. Yeah, I haven't read it. Uh, I do know the book that you mentioned. I, I would say uh, we're already on that path, um, and you don't necessarily have to be rich. And if you look at our phones, as I mentioned before, that, that's a great example. It's like an appendage to us now. So there is a bit of a delay in terms of, you know, we can't download, say, Wikipedia, but we can search for it. Um, and essentially have all that knowledge uh, on us at any point in time. Um, I, I think, you know, again, we, we need to be careful about how fast the technology goes. But I think the, the worst, the, the other end of the spectrum is, is sort of stopping this, this progress is the worst thing. Um, but being mindful that there could be things ahead that we're not clear of. But that's, that's always a hard thing to do. But historically, at least the last hundred years, I mean, imagine our life without the computer without the integrated chip, our life would be so different. Um, you know, so I think it's important we keep progressing, but keep an eye out on how things are evolving. So how important do you think artificial intelligence and quantum uh, uh, computing is to the world? Is it is it like the creation of the internet? Is it like the creation of electricity? Give it a, a historical uh, description of how important this is. Uh, in terms of quantum and AI, I don't know the, the uh, sort of combination yet. It's too early to tell. But more generally, quantum computing, I would put it up there with, um, you know, the creation of the Internet, um, the creation of the integrated chip, say Intel. I think they were formed in 1968 um, and the PC computer, I think, up there with them for sure. Um, it, it is one of the most transformational technologies of all time. You know, we, we the team, what the team here is doing in Toronto, I think it's harder than, um, you know, the, the space race of, of the 60s, you know, what was achieved there. And that was one of the most memorable things in history landing on the moon but from a technology point of view it's much harder what we're doing because now that's kind of one extreme the macroscopic world you know moons and large planets and and so forth and what we're dealing with is the other end of the spectrum which is the uh, microscopic one which is very very difficult uh, to do now it's not a fair comparison completely because we're leveraging computers and technology the last three, four, five decades as well. So we're not doing it in a vacuum. We're leveraging a lot of um, information and computing, but but it is it is one of the most difficult things. And I think, you know, we, we look at um, human progress as being proportional to compute power, you know, so, so essentially the more compute power we have, the more progress humanity will achieve. And quantum computing is um, right up there with, uh, you know, the progress. It'd be exciting, we'll, we'll all be dead, but looking at the end of this century, and think, what? imagine if we didn't have quantum computing. That's kind of the hope. It's like us saying now, imagine we didn't have the computer. Computers run our lives. We, we lose everything. We lose all the medical um, results. We lose all the um, you know, drug discovery and pharma. All those results came from computers. Uh, we lose our phone. We lose Wikipedia. We lose the internet. Like it's just, it's unfathomable. And I think something similar people will look back on for quantum computing. And in essence, all it is, is is solving problems far more quickly. Yeah, exactly. I'd, I'd say two types of problems. It's still a computer and it solves things much, much faster. Problems that would have taken six months to a year, you can do it in principle in a few seconds or, or hours. That's one set of problems. So problems that we can already solve, but much, much faster. And there's a second set of problems that we could never solve, you know, going back to that math problem, you know, it would have taken seven million years. So it's a problem that really you could never solve. Um, but now you can actually solve it in this case in two minutes. So two types of problems, both related to speed. One that would we can normally solve, but we solve it much faster. And the other one we could never solve. And now we can start solving. Unbelievable. Uh, let's go back to location for a second, because I think that was one of the keys of your speech um, and, uh, and, and the Board of Trade's desire to have you speak. Uh, you know, I used to be in the pharmaceutical business and people would tell me if you want to be successful in the pharmaceutical business, you got to be in New Jersey. And if not New Jersey, then at least research uh, triangle, because that's the first and the second largest agglomeration of pharmaceutical companies. And there's this huge benefit. Uh, uh, I, it was an Austrian. Uh, I can't remember the economist that talked about the spirits in the air um, that, uh, you know, you end up being able to get ideas. Uh, you end up being able to recruit people. Um, if you lose people, you lose them to competitors. You can stay in touch with them, et cetera. So there's this big benefit about being in an ecosystem in the pharmaceutical business 
in uh, in in the center of uh, New Jersey, a research triangle in the in the in in the venture capital business in Silicon Valley, in the IT business in Silicon Valley, or New York or Boston. But you're doing something different, and you're convinced it's the right decision. How do you actually combat that that magnetical uh, magnet uh, attraction to 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 move to Silicon Valley or or to the United States? Well, I, um, I come, for me personally, it comes back to um, life is short and you'd rather enjoy every day as much as you can. Not every day is going to be great, but on average, you'd rather be doing, um, you know, and in, in, in my case, what, what I'm doing. So I, I would have a better, happier life uh, living in Toronto than other places in the world. And so I don't really want to sacrifice uh, moving to a place just because it could, you know, make me miserable, but then, you know, it could help the company. Now, I think you have to do that. Um, probably you'd have to take that hit or that sacrifice maybe years ago. But the other thing now, since, you know, the 90s, the internet, work from home and, and uh, many, many different things that happen, it's not a barrier anymore. <clears throat> the other thing I would say too is that our, our goal ultimately is to build these quantum data centers all around the world. So even though our headquarters is based in Toronto, you know, a lot of these large companies like Amazon and others, they're, they're based, say, in that case in Seattle, but they have offices all around the world. So it gets blurry, really. Where, where are they located? You know where their head office is. But so, you know, we, we have uh, great plans for the world uh, if we're successful. That, that's what we'd like to do. But starting from Toronto and starting having our headquarters in Toronto is, is key. As I mentioned, we opened up an office recently in uh, an entity in, in the U.S. And we have about seven or eight people in the U.S. So we're expanding there all the time. We're a fabulous company. So we do all our chip designs in-house, but then send them off to foundries that make our chips. And uh, we work with, I think, two or three foundries in, in uh, three foundries in the U.S. And two of them are actually in New York State. So we can actually drive, you know, it takes four or five hours or so from Toronto to get to the foundries. So it's very localized anyway. And I think that's what's great about Toronto. You're very close to the U.S., very close to Europe and, and so forth. So it can be done. I always want to, I love reading. I think uh, we talked about my uh, set of books behind me. You know, where did this Jersey thing start? Where did Silicon Valley start? You know, they started from kind of, you know, nothing as well. Silicon Valley, I think, uh, had HP there around World War II or so. And then Shockley came um, and really started the semiconductor industry. But Shockley, um, he started because his mother lived in, in uh, Silicon Valley, which is just apple fields and things like that. So, you know, if we think long term, I think we can also create a gravitational pull around Toronto. And, and it's not just Xanadu. There's many other great companies here in Toronto, too, that can help create this pull. So I think they started uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, you know, one of them is proximity to uh, post-secondary educational educational uh, institutes, uh, um, and certainly in Silicon Valley, it was uh, you know Stanford and the connection uh, to uh, to that institution, uh, and then also sort of military. Uh, the military industrial complex, uh, it was, uh, you know, military funding. Um, and, you know, you've talked about the importance of uh, Canadian government funding. Certainly a lot of the the uh, IT businesses, uh, um, you know, in Silicon Valley got its start because of military, whether it's, you know, military post-World War II uh, and or, you know, the space, uh, the space race that you talked about uh, in the 1960s, 1950s and 1960s. So government funding and post-secondary institutions end up being pretty important. And you, I understand, have located right there at university and college. So is there a connection between you and the U of T? There is actually. Uh, we've hired a lot of great people from uh, University of Toronto. Some of our you know, stellar performers are actually from U of T. Uh, as mentioned, I was a postdoc at U of T, so I got to know a lot of great people there as well. Um, I, I think it really comes back to the fact that the Canadian government for the last 20 years has really put a lot of money into the education of quantum technology. So famous examples would be Perimeter Institute, uh, IQC, Institute of Quantum Computing, both of them are in Waterloo, uh, Vancouver, uh, UBC, Montreal, um, and, and even things like quantum um, uh, quantum cryptography, for instance, that was invented by two people, and one of them was Canadian, and I believe still lives in uh, Quebec. So the history is there. The government support has been there. Um, so therefore, it's just about people like Xanadu now commercializing um, what's what's been uh, uh, sort of learnt in in universities uh, in Canada? So um, the Canadian government has been great. I, I think uh, also as mentioned in terms of military complex, we work with DARPA. 
Um, we're not too far away. You know, it's just an hour flight. So that makes things a lot easier. Um, certain people from the U.S. military come and visit us as well um, in Canada. So um, I, I think that the, the good thing here is, um, you know, how do you really compete? And, and I mentioned before that we have photonics or light as our approach. So the, the best way really to compete is to have a technology that's further ahead than any other approaches in quantum computing. Now, to be fair, we're all kind of, you know, we're one of the leaders and the other leaders in the field are kind of on par. But we believe the photonics approach is one of the better approaches where, when it comes to scaling up. So if we were, um, you know, far behind in terms of the technology, I don't think the U.S. government would pay us much attention. But if you build something great, no matter where you are, people will come to you. So I think that's also our mindset and strategy. But as, as mentioned, we have offices office in the U.S. as well. What, what you're saying is interesting, Christian. You're saying that you're using photonics. Are there other people doing quantum computing not using light? Yeah, I would say the photonics now, it's on par in terms of popularity and interest and results. Um, but really, the last decade, it's all been uh, about um, electronic-based versions. So we have electronics in our lives as the quantum version of electronics. So, um, And those ones have been the most um, you know, popular. So to give you some examples, um, there's superconducting qubits. Um, it's basically an electronic approach. Uh, but more importantly, that's what Google and IBM is using. Um, and then you have another electronic-based approach called um, ion, um, ion traps. And so ions or electrons or atoms, they're being used there. Um, and that would be IonQ. That's a company that actually has gone public. So another interesting thing is three companies have gone public via SPACs uh, in the last couple of years in the quantum space. So, yeah, I would say they're the, the historically the more popular. That's where more of the government funding went, university funding went. Uh, and really, you know, 10 years ago, photonics was really the dark horse, but now it's really equal. And we believe one of the ones that will go ahead of everyone else. What a fascinating conversation. We're going to take a break uh, with our conversation with Christian and be back in two minutes with some concluding comments. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crabby Radio while we're on Saga 960. My guest tonight is Christian Weedbrook. He uh, is the founder CEO of Xanadu AI. He's a building a photonic quantum computer. He's a uh, uh, he's leading a company that has been described as a unicorn with over a billion dollar U.S. valuation, and he received a big award at a recent Toronto Region Board of Trade uh, dinner. Uh, Christian, when I saw your company, I was thinking about a Olivia Newton John uh, video or something like this. Where does the name Xanadu come from? Perfect. It's you're absolutely right. It's actually from the the song Xanadu by Olivia Newton John. And as you know, there was a movie. The movie wasn't uh, I think that great or that successful, but the soundtrack is is wonderful. And uh, yeah, so it's named uh, after the song. Um, now the way that came from is I, I'm a big fan of the Beatles, and I thought it'd be fun to name it. Maybe even call ourselves McCartney or Lennon as the literally the company name. Uh, but that didn't seem right. And so then we thought maybe Electric Light Orchestra, uh, ELO. They, they were uh, famously called the son, Sons of Beatles because of their inspiration. And then the lead singer, Jeff Flynn, he actually wrote um, Xanadu. So that's where the name came from. But another interesting thing, too, is not many people know. Olivia Newton-John's uh, grandfather was one of the most famous physicists of all time, Max Born. And uh, not many people know that. So he was up there and collaborated with Einstein and others of last century. So it's nice to have that other connection as well. Christian, this has been a really interesting conversation. If people want to follow your progress, is there a, a website that they should go to to check out uh, Xanadu? Yeah, for sure. Xanadu.ai. It's very uh, easy to remember. And we'll also have our Twitter account, which updates everyone as well. Uh, Christian, you know, this has been really interesting. Um, I congratulate you and I look forward to your progress. And I look forward to when you go public so I can buy a share. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You know what? Christian probably doesn't even know what AM radio is all about. He's such a technologically uh, advanced individual. But AM radio is still there. And uh, I'm on every night at 6 o'clock. Uh, you can also get me on social media. Uh, I post all my uh, websites, all my uh, all my social media uh, blogs and, uh, and videos uh, and podcasts on social media as soon as it goes on live at the radio. Stay with... Stay... Uh, Tune to me every night at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. Good night, everybody.